the piper who plays at nine o'clock after the royal breakfast. She spends her time going through the royal rituals, pressing the flesh with ambassadors or aging celebrities, anyone who needs the boost of pomp and circumstance. Michael's day begins at 7.30, when he sets out on a half-hour drive to work. He works at the Australian Rice Research Institute. It's an enormous farm where Michael and two mates are engaged on an ongoing quest to find a sort of rice suitable for the parched landscape to feed Australia and Southeast Asia. Yeah, I don't know what fertiliser we've got left, Mike, but oh, sorry, we'll have a look through the these bins. Bin. Well, Do you want to start, start tucking down in the bedford? All right. And Matt and I might try and work out what's in the Others. other bins. One of the interesting things about our Plantagenet King is that he started off as a standard British public schoolboy with the title. But something in his character transformed him into a regular Aussie bloke who'd vote to get rid of the monarchy. Like Prince Harry, Michael came to Australia to do some jackarooing in a sort of gap year. But his temporary stay became permanent. After a couple of other jobs, I joined a company called Dennis Lascelles. They were a stocking station agency. A stocking station agency over here is a combination of kind of buying and selling properties and sheep and cattle and all that kind of thing. And they sent me to Geraldry. That's how I started in Geraldry. That was in 1966. And I've been there ever since. It's a very small town. What's in it for you? The casualness, the friendship, the lifestyle. That's the bit I like. After only a couple of days in the bush, I could see what attracted our real king to the tough but uncomplicated Australian lifestyle. I mean, I'd check if you did that for me. <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as you start getting into the swing, there's always someone happy to point out that you're still a pom. Forty years on, I'm still a pom, or that pommy bastard, you know, one or the other. Yeah. Oh yes, well that, that's that's typical Australian. Though. Oh yes. You know, I, I, I don't think I'll ever become a local. It doesn't rankle. No, not at all. Not at all. I spent more time with Michael at work and off duty. He showed me the sights of Jeril Dere. To be frank, I'm a city person. I'd have gone mad here after more than a week. But at the same time, I envied him. Compared with the dysfunctional Windsors, our Plantagenet monarch lives right at the heart of a close-knit family and community. Whatever the and put-downs, it seemed to me that he'd made a life for himself out here that was far better than any that he could have had as King of Britain. Because I was friggin' working. At least I turn up. <laughs> what do you friggin' do after talk? My wife had red hair. She was fairly fiery. I think I was not quite 21 when I met Noel, and I was 26 when we got married. And she probably thought, oh, can I really marry a pommy? What do you think Nolene, an all-Australian girl, would have said if she'd known that she was really the Queen of England? I think she would have probably said, get me another stubby, Michael. I think I'm going to need it. If the Queen abdicated, if she said, I've had enough of it, would you go back? Probably not. Probably not. And I couldn't blame him. But I still wondered what Britain would have been like if our alternative history had happened. We wouldn't have had Henry VIII, so Britain might still be a Catholic country like Ireland. And Britain was only formed because James VI of Scotland became James I of England as well. So there'd be an independent Scotland with its own king. 
And what about our current royals? Well, we've never had the House of Hanover either, so maybe, just maybe, somewhere in Germany today, a very ordinary and elderly lady who may or may not be called Elizabeth goes to buy a few slices of breakfast. Guten Tag. Guten Tag. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good I've got the answer to the question I was asking myself. I now know who should be ruling Britain in another reality. Except, of course, in real life, things are just as they are. King Michael's far too happy down under to think about storming across the seas to occupy Britain and seize Buckingham Palace. So, if that's the case, what was the purpose of the whole exercise? Well, for me, I really understand something now about the nature of history itself. It's fragile. It's accidental. For instance, this is Ashby de la Zouche Castle. It's the epitome of the kind of power that the Hastings had when they were at the height of their dominance. It's strong, it's big, it's confident. Whereas over there is the little house where Michael's mother lived for most of her life. It's unassuming, it's modest, it's normal, just like Michael himself, a million miles away from all the trappings of monarchy. Which reminds me of the medieval notion of the Wheel of Fortune, where some people rise up while others are cast down below. And that makes me think of the whole career path of the Plantagenet family. What would have happened if people had cottoned on to the fact that Edward was a bastard much earlier? Or if Henry Hastings' horse had come in first, not second? We tend to think nowadays of the monarchy as such a solid institution, whereas in fact wealth and privilege and power and status just hang by a thread. There's no such thing as the divine right of kings. Because we haven't even started to talk about the enormous power that the monarch's got. Even no, today. well, that's right. They, uh, they, I suppose a lot of the power's been taken, but... Uh... There's still some around. Do you fancy knighting me? Oh, not. 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 Have a look around here. It's a Tony of Horsbury. Horsbury, hey. Victoria. I W T of Horsbury Road. Arise, Sir Tony. Thank you very much. I feel better for that. Oh, look, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I've got a spring in my step. Oh, that's good. That's wonderful. Do we get a barbecue tonight? <laughs>